You know, just have a good time here. Uh, we also are um, having some um, special meetings. Uh, just uh, remember that uh, every Wednesday there is a prayer meeting going here at church. You are welcome to come and also join that. I know it's a great time to pray. And when we pray, we, are, we know that we're talking to God and God listens our prayers. Um, this morning, we're happy to be here and just uh, get together to enjoy this time that God separated for us to have a refresh in mind, spirit, body, and also to have communion with each other and with him. So I would like to invite you to say happy Sabbath to each other, uh, greet each other, and just have a good time uh, seeing each other right now.
Good morning. Good morning. Um, all the people in here that love to praise God, I wondered if you could stand up for our opening hymn. Let's pray. Dear God, we come here in front of you this morning, just as we are. We thank you for giving us this great opportunity to worship your name, to have um, freedom, and to be saved in Jesus. Today we pray that if anyone is here with a heart that is with burdens, you can take that. Help us to enjoy this Sabbath morning, enjoy this service, and enjoy this um, worship to you. Thank you for your blessings upon us. We love you, God, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Can you hear me? All right. I'll try to talk loud enough so you can all hear me. I wanted to introduce to you this morning our ambassadors from our Good News Television program that we have in the state of Arizona. Each church should have one. We're very fortunate in that we have a number of them. And I'd like to introduce them to you. Susan Herper, that's in the back of the church. She's standing back there if you wanted to look at her. And uh, then uh, we have uh, Lisa Hakes. She's not here today, but she's uh, usually here. And then we have myself. I'm also a board member as well as an ambassador. And then we have several honorary ambassadors. We have uh, Deanne Jacobs that's uh, up here in front with us. And we have Marlene Wolverton. And Marlene says, oh, we're going to be moving away. 
And uh, I said, how soon? And where to? She said, we're moving to around Payson area. And I said, that's good, because Payson is one of the areas where we have a good news television station. In fact, it's probably going to go on cable in Payson. That's in the mail right now, so that they would be able to get good news television on their cable. The reason I bring this to your attention is that you'll hear about good news television at least every two or three months to remind you that we have a privilege and a duty to support good news here in our city, as well as throughout the states in six other different places. So 90% of our area is capable of receiving good news TV without cable. They just stick it out on their antenna and more and more people are going cable free because it's going higher all the time. And so that's important. But as you see these uh, ambassadors uh, stand before you, uh, you will uh, note that they'll be having certain things that they'll talk about. One of them is they'll thank you for your offerings and your support. Number two, it's a regular promotion of Good News TV to your congregation and, uh, of course, uh, the support. As the ambassador, you will keep the ministry before the members by regularly sharing Good News TV updates to the congregation on Sabbath morning and sharing one on one when you possibly can. We ask the church please to approve these short little vignettes that you'll get once every quarter. There'll be a regular presentation at our ambassador meetings. Now, these will be meetings where the ambassadors are just together by themselves. In order to show your support and stay informed of current activities within the Good News TV ministry, the ambassador needs to regularly attend these meetings, which are held every two months. Then another uh, duty of the ambassador will be to inform Good News TV staff at the television itself uh, of the outreach events of your church. We're going to have an outreach event this year in October uh, when we will have uh, uh, Brother Bradshaw hold his evangelistic series, and that will be promoted through Good News TV. And it is to also in share the, to share the information about upcoming events uh, other than that. In other words, if you have a special program of some kind or other, you will have that advertised on Good News TV. And then the last uh, item is to help nurture Good News TV viewers to become a part of your church. As they come visit your church, your greeters need to be aware of them and uh, need to put you in touch that there's uh, someone from Good News TV, a viewer that's coming to take part in your Sabbath worship. So you have the ambassador involved there. So we're glad that the ambassadors are willing to serve, and uh, we uh, trust that they will uh, be your connection to Good News TV. And uh, the end result is I'm going to have George pay, play one uh, little vignette on uh, a convert that came into the church. And so go ahead with that, George. My name is Bill Johnson. I'm 88 years old. I'm sorry to say my wife passed away approximately eight years ago. 
And I never was much of a TV watcher, so I have a, uh, a antenna on my TV. That's the only TV I have now. I have for years have had uh, uh, satellite TV and so forth. My wife watched it all the time. I've been blessed to be able to watch uh, uh, Amazing Facts, uh, 3ABN, on Good News TV just with just my antenna. And I uh, ran, came across uh, uh, Doug Bachelor on uh, Amazing Facts TV. I got to watching him a whole lot, and uh, became rather interested in what he has to had to say. And then uh, I became a little more familiar with the Seventh Day Adventist Church uh, through his uh, teachings and uh, preachings on uh, TV, and. Uh, I was I was quite impressed with the fact that everything that he said or everything that the Seventh Day Adventist Church stands for is comes right out of the Bible. It's all backed up by the Bible, and everything, including the Sabbath, that which most people don't uh, uh, honor at all, is biblical, and uh, that's what really brought me. Uh, it, into the Seventh Day Adventist Church, and uh, I've, I've got to say that just the, the minute I walked in the door, in fact, before I walked in the door, I met a young lady out in front who was a greeter, and uh, she's become a very close and dear friend of mine. She and her husband, and uh, I walked in the doors of this church, and as soon as I walked into the foyer, I just felt right at home. Something just came over me, or I, I just I just felt this is where I belong, and so I've been attending this church ever since. I I, I was baptized in a, uh, a Protestant church, probably uh, two to three years ago, uh, and uh, after I came to the Yuma Central uh, pastor here asked me if I would consider being baptized again. Now, I was also baptized uh, uh, after, after I started attending this church. I've, I've been blessed to uh, be able to watch uh, Amazing Facts TV, 3ABN, on Good News TV with my TV antenna. And uh, that, that is, uh, their, their programming is absolutely wonderful. There's so many uh, different uh, uh, speakers on there, pastors and one thing or another that are just absolutely out of this world. Then every one of them is just absolutely excellent. Happy Sabbath. It's so nice to see all of you here today. Well, I have a couple of little short stories that happened to me in my lifetime, and I hope that it will give you um, a really great idea of a, a good lesson. So, first of all, have any of you ever gone skiing? Only one person, and that's a mommy down here? Nobody else has gone skiing? Oh, good. Okay. Well, let me tell you something. To go skiing, you need these big, long skis. You need to have proper ski boots, and these boots have to fit into something called ski bindings. And the bindings are put on the skis, and when you step into these bindings, it clips your, your ski boot right into the binding. And unless you have a, a fall, a bad fall, these are supposed to stay on your, your feet. So I was taught how to ski when I was in high school. I was about 16 years old, and the first three or four times I went skiing, I had to rent the skis and the boots and the poles. And I loved it. It was so much fun. And then for Christmas one year, my that, that winter, my dad bought me some beautiful red and gold canisal skis. But guess what? They were all shiny and new, but there were no bindings on them. So I couldn't ski with them unless I got some bindings. So I went down to the, the ski shop, 
And by the way, before you can go skiing on skis, you have to have them hot waxed on the bottom so they're nice and slippery and you don't get stuck in the snow. So I picked out some bindings for them to put onto the skis. I couldn't do that. They had to do it with their special tools. And I paid to have the skis hot waxed. So I was really excited to go and pick up my new skis and the bindings were on them and oh, they felt so slippery on the bottom. I knew I was going to be able to go fast. So the young person at the cash register said, okay, that will be $19.99. And I'm thinking, what? That's too cheap to pay for new bindings and the hot wax. And I said, does, is that including everything? And the young person said, oh, yes, it, it is. And I said, that pays for the new bindings too? And she's in the, all of a sudden, this young lady, her face just kind of dropped and she went, Oh, you got new bindings? I didn't realize. I thought you just got the hot wax. I said, Oh no, I picked out new bindings and they installed them for, for me. And she goes, Oh, thanks for telling me. So now the bill went up to about $99 which was more reasonable, and I th I thought, well, I'm so glad I said something, because, you know, if I had walked out of there with those skis, knowing that I'd gotten free bindings, I would have felt really guilty, even though she made the mistake. So I, but my mom and dad always taught me to be honest. That was the first thing that I can remember way back when that happened, but another thing happened to me about a, a two years later when I was a senior in high school. I was 18. I had my own car, and I was going to go on a trip, and I wanted to drive through the bank. I suppose you've been in the car with your moms or dads, and they've gone to the bank and did not want to get out of the car and go inside, so you go through the little drive through right, and somebody helps you on the other side, generally, and um, so I had written a check for $500, and I needed that $500 to go on this trip. And so I gave the the lady that was on the other side of the, the glass window my ch check. And she said, I'll be right back. I'll go get you your cash. So she came back and through the window, she counted out one, two, three, four, five hundred dollars. And she put it in the little container and it went through the trough and it came out to me. And the first thing you should always do, even though if somebody counts the money for you and you've watched them, you should still recount it. So before I drove off, right in front of her, I'm counting the, the money. 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600. Wait, 600? I only wrote that check for 500. I recounted it a second time. It's pretty easy to count to six, isn't it? I was correct. It was 600. So I said to the young lady, excuse me, but you gave me $100 too much. And she went, oh, oh no. She goes, oh my goodness, thank you for telling me. If you hadn't told me, I might have gotten fired from my job. And I said, oh, of course. And so I sent her back the $100. And I thought, oh, I'm so glad I noticed that because I would have felt terrible if I'd gotten home and realized she had given me too much. I would have driven back down there and given it to the bank. That's how I feel about it. So this, these two stories teach us about something called honesty, right? We need to always be honest, even if we think nobody else will find out what's gone on, even if it's not our fault. I could have easily been dishonest, walked out of the ski shop with those new bindings and never paid for them, and nobody would have ever known except who? God would have known, Jesus would have known, and of course I knew. I would never want to dishonor Jesus or God by being dishonest. And same with my story about the money. I would I just wanted to always be honest. And do you know that you as children can be honest too? If you ever find something, say you find somebody's wallet on the street, and you think, oh no, somebody's lost their wallet, and there is their driver's license, all their credit cards, they probably have some cash. The honest thing to do in that situation would be to do what? Come up here and so you can tell us what you would do if you found that wallet in the street. Take the wallet to the police station. Perfect. I like that. Now, you know, something similar happened to um, our one of our sons. Um, we were all up skiing in Colorado, 
Our boys were nine years old and 12 years old at the time. We were done skiing for the day, and we sat down on the bench waiting for the bus to take us to the parking lot. And Michael, our 12-year-old, looked down to loosen his boots, and when he looked down, there he found a wallet underneath the bench. He picked it up and he went, oh no, somebody dropped their wallet. And he's looking around. I never told him what to do. He, stu he stood up, he opened the wallet to see the name of the person's name on their license. I can't remember the person's name, but it was a man's name. And he got up and he started yelling, you know, Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown. Pretty soon some men walking way ahead of us stopped, turned around, and this man, whatever his real name was, says, oh, I'm him. What do you want, son? And the man came back, and Michael said, I just found your wallet. And the man said, oh, my goodness. You know, and he was there for a long, for a whole week vacation. He said, thank you for being so honest. And he opened up his wallet, and he said, let me give you a $20 bill for thanking you for being so honest. Michael said, oh, no, thank you, sir. This is your wallet. You don't need to pay me for being honest. And you know what? I was one proud mommy because I never even told him what to do. He had just grown up learning to be honest, just like I'm sure all of you are growing up learning to be honest. So no matter how old you are, no matter where you are in the world, there are opportunities to be honest, and it shows other people, maybe people that aren't believers in Jesus, that aren't Christians. You know, we as Christians like to be honest to be faithful and true, to follow God's commandments. And we can share that really with the people around us, even if they are not Christians. So I hope you'll remember these three little stories. And someday maybe you'll have some stories of your own to share with us. Thank you so much for being great listeners. You can go back to your seats. Thank you, Kim, for that story of honesty. Now it's time for us adults to participate, giving uh, back to God what he has given to us, so part of what He has given to us um, are tithes and offerings. Um, this morning offering goes for Arizona evangelism, and if you think about what is evangelism, it's basically what God commanded us to do, which is take the message, the gospel, out to the world. And as a church, we do that in different ways. Um, we do that when we preach at a church. We do that when we have conferences going on. We do that when we have um, children's ministry, when we have, um, you know, women's ministry, when we have all these things that help to reach that goal, which is take this message to the world. So I would like to invite the um, deacons to move forward, and we are going to pray for our tithes and offerings this morning. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for so many blessings that you give to us. We are about to give back to you just a part of uh, what you have given to us. And we pray that you can bless these offerings, you can bless our tithes, and that can be used for your honor and glory, that the gospel can be preached um, to every corner in the world, and that everyone can hear about Jesus. Help us to live according to your will so that our lives can also be a sermon to others. We love you, God, and we pray for this in Jesus' name.
that changed my life. And no matter how many times I hear this story, I just, I love to hear it again. I'm sure you guys are the same way. I just, tell me the, uh, tell me the story of Jesus.
Our scripture reading this morning is in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. I'm going to read from the King James Version, and it says, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Well, the uh, message today is about uh, anxiety and worry, and if we'd have broadcasted that, we'd probably have half the crowd here today, because he said, I ha I've experienced it all week. I don't expect to get it on Sabbath. Uh, and so we'll try to make it as light as we possibly can, and so forth. It would be nice to have, and uh, I might say that, usually when someone speaks about a certain subject, it's because they're the ones that are dealing with it. Did you ever know that? That's why they used to change pastors every five years. We knew all of his problems after about three and a half months and so forth. Uh, so anyway, uh, we might, uh, when you catch Pastor Jay, you might remind him of that uh, and so forth. But no worry, no anxiety, I will tell you right now, I wish that was the case. Of all the living things that God has created, it seems like human beings are the only ones that worry. We worry about taxes. We worry about finances. We worry about our jobs. Parents worry about their children. Children worry about their parents. You name it, somebody is worrying. And if we could categorize worry into maybe four different areas, we would think about, first of all, change creates problems for us. Relationships create problems for us. Health issues, and lastly, money. Pretty much all worry and anxiety falls in those categories. Now, several years ago, there was a comedian by the name of Bob Newhart. How many know Bob? Not well, as young as I thought. Bob Newhart did a sketch about a particular occupation many years ago, which epitomized, in essence, what stress and anxiety is all about. And he talked about the hundreds of men and women who, in essence, would leave their house every morning not knowing exactly what they would look like at the end of the day. And he was talking about the driver training instructor. Let's visualize for just a moment a home sitting in suburban Chicago. And there is a late model car in a driveway, and a middle-aged woman is climbing in on the driver's side, and her name is May Robinson. On the other side of the car, a young man steps into the passenger side, and his name is Chris Taylor. And this is the second training session, driver training session for Mrs. Robinson. So let's pick up on the dialogue as we're talking there in the car. Well, good morning, Mrs. Robinson. I'm Chris Taylor. It's good to be with you this morning. I'm your new driver training instructor. And you know what? We're going to have a good time today. We're not going to be anxious. We're not going to be afraid. In fact, you're going to learn many things today. Things will give you confidence. Things will make you a safer driver and help you to drive in metropolitan Chicago. Now, I have a few questions I'd like to ask you, if I may. Is that okay? Okay, good. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this is your second training session, is that right? Oh, okay, that's good. And uh, your previous trainer was uh, Mr. Johnson, is that true? Okay, good. Uh, now, uh, how fast were you going when Mr. Johnson jumped out of the car? <laughs> uh, se 75 miles an hour. Uh, could you tell me exactly where that was at? In your driveway. Uh, yeah, I, I know you feel bad about that. You know, I checked on him, and, you know, I think he's going to be just fine. It's another three weeks of traction, and I think he'll be just, just great. Now, uh, I don't want you to worry about that. Now, how far did you get into the lesson in the training session with him? Uh, backing out, I see. Okay, well, that's good. It's good to know. Now, first of all, before we start this morning, I want you to do a few things. First of all, are you familiar with all the gauges on the dash? Okay, that's good. Uh, uh, what about the rear view mirror? You know how to use that. That's good. What about the two side mirrors? How about the accelerator? You know about that? Well, that's pretty obviously you do. Yes. Now, now the brake is very important, Mrs. Robinson. Now, wait a minute. What's that? 
Before Mr. Johnson jumped out of the car, he yelled to use an alternate way of stopping. What, what's an alternate way of stopping? Slamming it into reverse. I, well, that would work. Sure, I understand that. All right, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and get started this morning. And the first thing I want you to do is to start the car. Uh, Mrs. Robinson, you just turned on the windshield wipers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I agree. Everything looks about the same, doesn't it? Well, I'll tell you what. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and back out. Now, make sure you to check your rear your mirror. Mrs. Robinson. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to make you cry. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, well, you see there was this bus. Oh, that's okay. Let's just don't worry about it. Let's go ahead and back out, and uh, you're doing fine. Very good. What's that? Uh, you, you, you're afraid to drive in traffic. Uh -huh. You're afraid you're going to block a lane. Well, I, I don't think you have anything to worry about. As long as you're sitting here in the safety area in the middle of the highway, you won't be able to worry about that. That's okay. Now, let's, uh, let's start uh, driving here. Let's go ahead and put that in drive. That's that number that says D on there, that letter. Uh-huh. Uh, well, now, since we're in reverse, I guess we can, we can go ahead and do that now. I was going to wait till the end of the lesson, but that's okay. Let's go ahead and do that. All right, let's stop here now, and we're going to work on turns. And what I'd like you to do is I want you to kind of ease in. This is a one-way road, and we're in the far left-hand lane. There are three lanes here, and I want you to take a right. Okay, and you think you can do that? Okay, good. Let's let's do that. That's good. Mm -hmm. Very good. That's great. Um, uh, yeah, that, that, that you know that was one of the better turns I've seen in my life. Now you did the right thing. You had the right hand turn lane on. You eased into each lane. I just kind of assumed you were going to turn right, not in front of the three lanes of traffic. Uh, uh, yeah, they'll stop honking any minute now. Uh, uh, and yes, uh, they're not saying nice things, especially that man you knocked off the road and that's sitting on that fire hydrant over there. But that's okay. We're going to be just fine. So uh, let's let's try another turn. Uh, well, I didn't mean really to turn into this alley, but uh, you know uh, we could do some alley training. That would be good. Uh, and so forth. I think we're the only instruction school that does alley training. Now you got to slow down. You're going too fast, Mrs. Robinson. Uh, okay, good. Now, uh, uh, wait a minute. I think we're going to have to hold up here. I don't think we can get between that truck and that building, Mrs. Robinson. Uh, Mrs. Ro Mrs. Robinson. Uh, well, I've been wrong before. I don't know how we got through that, but that's 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 great. Uh, let's get back on the road again if we can, and uh, let's try another turn. Uh, if you could turn right up here, oh, Mrs. Robinson. I met at the next street, not in this man's yard. Now, just a second. Let me roll down the windshield. Uh, sir, sir, uh, could you turn off the sprinklers, please? Uh, just seated. I can see it. Well, I, I, yeah, I can understand you'd be a little burned up. But, uh, uh, Mrs. Robinson, we're going to have to back out. Uh, this man's really unhappy uh, and so forth. So make sure you check your rearview mirror. Oh, Mrs. Robinson, you just hit someone. You, uh, you, you were blinded by the light, the red light. The flashing red light on the car you just hit. Uh, yes, officer, she was just telling me about it uh, and so forth. Yeah, I can't believe it either. I'm her driver training instructor. Uh, what was that? Uh, why do you want my name? Uh, so you can get me the next time. I see. Well, uh, Mrs. Robinson, look, uh, I'm going to have to go downtown. This officer is not really happy with me, and I might be down there for quite a while. Uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, there's another officer here. Would you mind just going home with him? Uh, when is our next lesson? I think we may have to do a rain check. How many would like to be a driver training instructor today? Well, it would be nice if we could humor our way through life. More than anything else, I like to have a proactive attitude, but it's not always easy. Worry and anxiety is a part of life. And I'll tell you why it's not a good thing. It damages our health. It disrupts our productivity. It has an effect on how we treat others. And lastly, it reduces our ability to trust in God. But because of the world that we live in, 
Worry and anxiety is a huge problem. Would you agree? And we're going to give you some solutions today that are somewhat elementary and somewhat simple. But Jesus thought and would agree with us today that worry and anxiety is a problem because on one of his most famous sermons, the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about life. And some of us are saying, you're kidding, right? But that's what he said. Don't worry about you, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and clothing? You know, my freshman year of college, I took Psychology 101. Now, that's been a few years back. I don't even know if they offer that course anymore. But uh, I remember we studied one thing in particular, Abraham Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs Theory. How many remember that? And how many tiers were there? Do you remember? Five. Hey, that's good. Five. Okay. You want to come up here and finish this? Or? Oh, okay. All right. Well, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs Theory is basically a five-tier model of human needs in kind of a hierarchical level type thing that when you get past the first one on the bottom and you go to the second one, then you go to the third. And the first one is physiological needs. I'll come back to that in a minute. Then there's safety. Then there's relationship. And actually at the end one is called self-actualization. Did you know that Jesus addressed Maslow's theory of, of, of relativity? I say relativity because he didn't, didn't probably have this at all. But he addressed Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And he addressed the physiological needs. Why do you think he would start at the bottom tier? Because the bottom tier basically involves survival. And Jesus said, don't worry about your survival. That's really what he was saying. What is these things? Well, shelter, food, and clothing. Pretty hard to live without those. Jesus said, I don't want you to worry about it and that mass crowd on the Judean hills. Because you know what? They have the same problem we have. We're anxious and we, and we worry. You know, Jesus pointed out something pretty practical. And this is interesting. He said, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than them? Can any one of you, isn't this a great statement, can any one of you, by willing, add a single hour to his life? Well, it's a good point. We probably reduce the hours we'll be living by that constant eye of stress. Jesus is concerned about your anxiety. He's concerned about mine. Because as we read the scripture reading this morning, Cast all your anxieties on him. Why? Because he cares for you. That's why he wants your anxieties, because he cares. He's concerned. And so this morning I am going to approach the answer to this issue in a relatively simple way in one of the greatest stories in the entire Bible, the miracle at Cana. What a wonderful, wonderful story that is. There are so many sermons that can come out of that. And today you'd say, well, we're going to get stress and worry out of that story. This story is interesting, and it's somewhat puzzling. Why would Jesus use this event to kick off his ministry? Now, let's say that you were asked to be his PR agent. And you're going to prepare the event that will be the kickoff of Jesus' ministry. So you're a PA, PR agent for an, a large firm, and they say, all right, we'll take that job. So we get into this large conference room, and everybody said, well, first of all, we all agree it's got to be spectacular. It's got to be something that'll get people's notice. So one fellow says, well, you know what? I got an idea. Why don't we have him walking on water? Another fellow says, wait a minute. How about him feeding 5,000 Happy Meals. Another guy says, I got a better idea. How about him raising somebody from the dead? 
Everybody agrees in that meeting, it must be spectacular. And that's why the, we, the wedding at Cana is absolutely shocking. Because it's far from being spectacular. It's probably the most simple miracle that Jesus ever performed. And even though it seems simple, when you think about it, it was very practical. And here's why. Why did Jesus perform this miracle? If we look at the scriptures, they give one primary reason. They were out of wine. And we would say, so? They were out of wine, yet Jesus chose this first miracle to deal with an issue of being out of wine at a ceremony to kick off his ministry. That is amazing to me. But it also tells us something. They ran out of wine. Why is it a big deal? That wedding is really a picture of life. The problem was that they were running on empty. And how many times do you and I, have we had the experience of running on empty? We've got a problem we can't solve. We're in a crisis that we cannot handle. We've dug ourselves in a hole that we just can't get out. We're at the end of our rope. You ever been at the end of your rope? I had a situation in a particular laboratory that I consult with, and they went through what we call a LIS conversion. That means laboratory information system. And if some of you who uh, understand what I'm talking about, if you went through one of those conversions, it is an absolute nightmare. The lab director who was trying to head up part of that program was receiving so many emails and so many things going wrong that she said, I, I'm at the end of my rope. She was so stressed. But you know what? When we're running on empty, there's something that God's trying to tell us. Our problems are God's possibilities. You have to think about that. The miracle that Jesus performed at that wedding was very simple. It gives us one of the most profound lessons that you and I will ever learn. It gives us a formula that never fails in addressing worry and anxiety. So what do we learn? Number one, if you take your Bibles with me, I want to turn to John, the second chapter, verses 1 through 3. You know, I'm always amazed that this story of the wedding in Cana was only mentioned in one of the Gospels, right? The book of John. Maybe one of the reasons that John is one of my favorite books. Well, let's read the text. Verse 1. On the wedding day, or on the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no wine. The problem? They had no wine. It's that simple. Why was that such a big deal? Back then, wine was to a wedding as a wedding cake is to us today. Can you imagine going to a wedding and there's no cake? Hmm, I can't. You know, I uh, just a little bit of information, which you probably don't need, is that we had a tradition many years ago that um, you always stored your wedding cake. And they always say the flavor of the cake over the years would probably, hopefully, would match or improve over the wedding, the marriage itself. Well, after about the fifth year on our cake, it wasn't getting too good. The wedding, the marriage was better, which is good to hear. But cake was important. In fact, one of the pictures that we have of our wedding, one of the major pictures is Carol cutting the cake with me looking over her shoulder, which is pretty much a common picture all the way through all of our pictures. But uh, so anyway, not having cake is not a life or death issue, but it's a problem. Not having wine at Canaan was not a life or death issue, but it was a problem. 
And you and I might say, well, this is a trivia situation. Who cares about the wine? There's got to be something more dramatic here. I want to tell you something. Jesus is interested in all of our problems. I don't care how trivia you or somebody else might think. Isn't that nice to know? These are real problems. They are day-to-day -day problems. They're problems we face day-to-day. -day. Jesus was more than happy to deal with every one of them. Losing your job, losing your keys. I have a son. That boy, when he loses his keys, it's a major problem. Isn't that right, Scott? <laughs> How many lose their keys? I see we have a few honest souls in the, in the congregation. That is a major disaster in some homes, right? But it's a problem. It's a real problem. You know, evidently, Mary, who was head of the ceremony or the marriage coordinator, if you will, she did not want embarrassment to come to her friends and to the bride and the groom. Is that a good reason to reach out? I think it is. Mary did exactly the first thing any of us should do when there is a problem. She took it to who? She took it to Jesus. Maybe trivia to you, but it wasn't trivia to her, and it certainly wasn't trivia to Jesus. She didn't push the panic button. She didn't pull out her hair. She didn't yell and scream. Her blood pressure was probably still relatively normal. She simply turned to Jesus and let him know, I have a problem. How many of us do that? How many of us do that? I know that that sounds rather simple and valid rather elementary, but the gospel is simple and elementary, and how many people do not accept it? You can't get any simpler than the gospel. We just can't buy it. We just can't believe that God would really forgive us, that God would really take our sins and throw them to the depths of the sea. Well, you do when you understand that Jesus is worried about not enough wine. I know that that's simple, and I said before, it's elementary, but let's be honest. What do we usually do? My guess is, too much of the time, when there is a problem, we turn to other people, anyone and anybody, and the last one we turn to is Jesus. It's just our tendency. Morris Venden tells a wonderful, I love Morris Venden. Morris Venden is the reason I'm here today. How many could say that? Morris Benden meant a lot to me. He changed my life through how he presented the gospel. And I will tell you something, I'll never forget that. And there are many others who have the same profession that I do. But Morris Benden told a story, and uh, he had an appointment to go to, and he had to get a couple of kids to school. So he climbs in the car, he goes to start it, and guess what? No, he had his keys. The car would not start. So Moore's Benton had the mechanical skills that I have, which is pretty much Zippo and so forth. And I have AAA, he didn't. So he went outside, he opened up the hood, he pulled off the battery cables, put them back on, checked through wires, kept going back and forth the car, turning on the car, wouldn't start. And finally, he was so upset. One of the kids from the back said, hey, Dad, why don't we pray about it? And Moore's Benton said, have we come to that point? Have we come to that point? Why do you think God allows problems to come into our life? God is strong enough. He is powerful enough to take our problems away. He could give us sunshine instead of rain. He could give us roses instead of thorns. But you know what? If that was true, we would never come to him. Have you thought about that? When are people most likely to come to Jesus? When they've got a problem. Isn't that right? What happens we take the problems away? There is a good thing in problems. Jesus wants us to lean on him. Do you ever remember the song? I don't even, we never sing this, Dan. Learning to what? You ever heard that song? What a song. Great song. Learning to lean on is the epitome of how to learn and live the Christian life. Would you agree? Learning to lean. Well, 
So when we're running on empty, we turn to Jesus. The second thing we need to do is talk to Jesus about the problem. You know, a problem well-defined is a problem that's half solved. You ever heard that? I know in the business world, we have to define the problem. Really define. What is the problem? Not the symptom. What's the problem? Once you have that straight, you're on your way to solving it. And when the wine, one, and when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, We have no wine. Well stated. This is exactly what Mary did. She tells exactly what the issue is. It's a big problem. In Bible days, a wedding was one of the greatest social events on the calendar. You got an invitation to a wedding and you didn't go. Uh, that's not a good idea. But what's interesting is how Jesus answered Mary. And that has always bothered me, at least up until a few years ago. To some people, it's amusing. Woman, why are you bothering me with this? Now we say, yeah, I can understand that. Who cares about the wine? And that's what he said. My hour has not yet come. I want to tell you something, husbands. If you're sitting in the uh, living room watching a, uh, a football game, and your wife says from the kitchen, hey, honey, would you uh, take out the garbage? And you say, dear, my time has not yet come. Uh, probably your time has come. Uh, if uh, you give that kind of response, I wouldn't recommend it. And so forth. Jesus really didn't mean the way it sounds. That was kind of the oriental approach to how they address people. What Jesus was really saying is that he was not willing to announce he was the Messiah. But he didn't tell her no. He really didn't say yes either. What he was telling her, he said, You know, Mary, I'm no longer your little boy. I'm obligated to do whatever you ask. I'm now the Messiah, and I must obey my true father. That's what he was saying. Mary didn't have any advantages over the rest of us. Jesus looked at her as he looks at you and me. He loves us all. He was starting his debut as the Messiah. And so, he had to remind her of that in a very key situation. But let's don't miss the bigger, bigger picture. Mary has a problem. She turns to Jesus, tells him the problem, and did he do it in order to impress people? You know why we can answer that he didn't? Because of the fact those people didn't know. The only one, and there's a reason why it didn't spread wide. I'll get to that in a minute. But they didn't know. The only ones that knew were the, were the servants and the disciples and Mary. Did he do it to announce that he was the Son of God? Of course, no. That's the very reason he probably didn't want to do it. But he did it because of what we find in First Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast your all your anxieties on him. He did it because he cares not only for Mary. He cared for that bride and groom. He cared for the people at that wedding. He did not want them to be embarrassed. Does that tell you something about Jesus? Does that tell you that he's concerned about everything we do? Is there anything we cannot take to him? The answer is no. And lastly, number three, first we come to Jesus, first we define the problem with him, and then one of the most important things, we trust Jesus to do as he's promised, to deal with the problem. And that, as I said before, the most important thing that we can do. You know, there's one thing that we need to do when our marriage is empty, when the bank account is depleted, and we have nothing left in the heart, is to do what Mary said. And here's what she said. Mary said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. That's all she said. That's the greatest piece of advice that you will find in the entire Bible. It's probably the best advice you'll ever find in history. We don't have a problem now or ever. 
that Jesus cannot solve. If we do what he tells us to do. What would have happened if the servants didn't fill the jars with water? Jesus said, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. You know, I think of the disciples. I bring it up a lot because the major problem the disciples had was that they wanted to see who'd be first. And so forth. And Jesus, time after time, tried to explain to them that the gospel and being a leader in the church, or being an apostle, means being head servant. To serve people. They never got it. In fact... Many times they would walk about a quarter mile behind Jesus so they would start arguing about who was going to be the greatest. It was like he couldn't hear. But Jesus didn't give up on them. But look how much happier they would have been if they would have taken his vice. This arguing at the Lord's Supper before his crucifixion would have been eliminated. God is patient with us. Aren't you thankful for that? And the apostles turned out just fine. Now let's take a look at how this worked in this ceremony. There were six jars of about 25 or 30 gallons, held 35 or 25 or 20, 30 gallons of water. And Jesus said, I want you to fill them up. Fill them to the brim. And you must remember, Jesus gave the command, fill them to the brim. I think if they filled them half full, it wouldn't have worked. We needed to follow him implicitly. And then it says here, and he said to them, now draw some out, take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water and how it had become wine, and he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn it did. He said, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. We must remember, we sometimes have it backwards. We think obedience follows blessing, but in reality, blessing follows obedience. Do you agree? So, when we do obey God, and we do what God tells us to do, we can expect him to come through. Jesus tells his followers, to fill those jars with water. Now, I want to share something with you. Those jugs normally held water that was used for ceremonial washing. I'm told today by many Jewish scholars, why in the world would you take water that was used to wash dirty hands and fill it with wine? If the master of ceremonies would have known, he could have placed them in prison for that very act. They risked their lives to take those jars to the master ceremonies. But they didn't have to worry. Because Jesus made this the sweetest wine that you could ever drink. And you know, the best thing of this story is something we just pass over. And we did this morning. I want you to look carefully at verse 2, John chapter 2. It says this, Jesus was also invited to the wedding. The greatest thing that happened that day was not that a bride and a groom became a married couple. The greatest thing that they did was to invite Jesus to that wedding. We've talked about three ways to handle problems. First, take it to Jesus. Number two, define the problem and discuss it with him. And number three, do what he tells you to do. But more important than that is have a connection with Jesus. Stay connected. And you can, you can approach the throne of grace at any time with confidence, knowing that he will deal with your issue. Remember, our problems are God's possibilities. Let's pray. Our Father, we give thanks again for Jesus and his love. You know, we, uh, we try to reserve the, what we think are the most important things, and we try to handle the others. We're sorry about that. 
we realize uh, as we take time to study your word that you care about everything. And we know that worry and anxiety really wears us down. We trust today that you'll help us to come to you, regardless of the situation, regardless of the problems, that will bring these things to you. We give thanks for your goodness and we give thanks for your grace. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. throne of grace because of our confidence in you. We give thanks for you. Watch care over us. We pray that your grace will follow us all through this week and we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Amen.